Hello everyone. We're going to be reviewing the finance sales contract. Um, the purpose of this is to not teach you how to read it, but just to interpret it, to understand it and explain it to the client that you're working with. So let's jump right into it. I got to emphasize first, always check with your broker for additional forms. Always check with your broker to see if the company has different forms and you have to continue the education. One class will not make you an expert. You need to review this over and over. You need to review the document and practice with someone. So let's dive into the finance sales contract. The first part of it is pretty self-explanatory. You will use the name of the purchaser as they have been qualified for by their lender and use the legal name for the sellers, whatever appears on the uh, MLS and the tax records, unless it's an estate, then make sure you put the estate there. It describes some of the things to convey with the property. It also references paragraph nine, so we'll spend a little bit more time in paragraph nine explaining some of the appurtenances and what conveys. The address, city, county, state, zip, lot, block, subdivision are vitally important. If it is in a platted subdivision, you have done your due diligence, you've pulled the tax record, pull, fill out all this information. On the legal description, if it is in a platted subdivision, you will be able to use that lot of whatever subdivision. However, if it has a longer legal description, it is going to be meet and bounds. And that's what you'll put in the legal description is meet and bounds. And uh, the attorney will be able to know uh, how to research that from the meet and bounds. The next four uh, lines, what I want you to do is to put the sales price and then the next three add up to that. So if it's going to be 500,000 and you're going to be putting 10% down, that's going to be 50,000 and they put 10,000 down as earnest money. So you're going to have a balance of somewhere in the neighborhood of $440,000 for the loan amount. So that's what you're trying to do is get that to balance and, and equal up. If you'll notice right under the uh, number one, it says earnest money held by the selling company and that's the company working with a buyer or, and there's a blank there. If it is not the company that is working with the buyer, then you'll need to put the name of the company or the title company that's holding that. That's Alabama license law and you need to follow that. Also, the last line says purchaser agrees to apply for said loan within blank working days, put three, five, whatever your broker tells you to do. And that starts the formal process. This has been the newest addition or revision to the sales contract. So I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this. Settlement charges. There are two settlement charges that are going to be involved in the real estate transaction. First one is the buyer broker compensation. As you see in the parentheses, it says it's optional. The seller has the option of paying the buyer's agent compensation. Now, let me say that again. This is optional. The seller has the option of paying the buyer's agent. So in this paragraph, you'll see that the seller agrees to pay the buyer broker either a percentage of the gross sales price or a flat fee, which is due and payable at closing. It says that the closing attorney has been directed to disperse the funds to the buyer broker from the seller proceeds at the time of sale. Notice it's underlined. If a seller concession is made available, the buyer shall determine which expense to apply to the seller concession. That is B, settlement charges. That's otherwise known as closing costs. It says the purchaser's settlement charges, sometimes the closing costs, include these fees. Now the seller has the option of paying a certain amount there. What's different about it than previous is that you'll notice in the next line, it says the, the last line, I'm sorry, the seller concession, if available, and there's a box is or is not to be credited toward buyer broker compensation. If yes, indicate the amount or rate that will be contributed to the seller concession by the buyer towards the buyer broker compensation to explain this to the consumer. 
you're working with the buyer if you're writing it up you're going to tell the buyer that you're going to ask the seller to pay a certain percentage for the buyer broker compensation that will be in paragraph a you may also ask the seller to contribute to the settlement charges for the buyer generally those were loan closing costs prepaid items things like that the thing that's changed is now some of that settlement charge can be used to pay the buyer broker but they have to acknowledge that that's going to be the case let's say an example your buyer agency agreement says x percent the seller's willing to pay y and also contribute to settlement charges the buyer has the option to say okay there's a discrepancy in the amount that's in my buyer agreement and what's on the contract so I'll take some of the settlement charges and move it that way you have to understand what settlement charges are what it can be used for what it can't be used for and how it's different than the buyer broker compensation so spend a lot of time in these two in this paragraph two if you have any questions check with your broker C, you need to determine where the closing is going to take place and put that attorney or the title company in that uh, blank. Survey, and if you'll notice, it is bold. It says it is, it is recommended that whenever title is passed, a new survey be obtained, which meets current standards of the Alabama Society of Professional Land Surveyors. If lender or attorney requires such a survey, the cost is considered a settlement charge. So settlement charge indicates it's generally a buyer cost however anybody can buy it I mean anybody can pay for it remember it's in bold strongly recommend that if a property is meet and bounds in other words a not in a platted subdivision that you strongly recommend that they get a survey because the land may have been 10 acres originally but some could have been shaved off some could have been given away deeded away whatever it may be so it may not be what somebody thinks it is conveyance this says that the seller to convey to the purchaser a general warranty. All this verbiage says is the attorney is going to settle any liens or encumbrances or clouds on the title. And when the buyer purchases the home, ownership will be passed with no liens on it. The buyer's mortgage company will place a lien on the property, but anything that belonged to the seller will not be there on the deed. It, uh, it will be um, taken care of. Title insurance, this says that the buyer and seller agree to split equally title insurance. What title insurance is, is protection for the buyer and the seller in case there is a claim that comes up later. Let's say an attorney does a title search. In their opinion, there's nothing, no, uh, no clouds, no liens, no anything on the title. However, somebody comes up later and says, that is actually my land and has legitimate reason the title company will then will get the attorneys involved and it won't be any cost to the buyer or the seller that's why they're buying this insurance policy title uh, closing and possession this is when everyone agrees to close the property where title will be transferred notice in the last line it says possession is to be given blank usually that says at closing if there's going to be either an extended stay by the seller or early occupancy by the buyer, check with your broker. That has some insurance ramifications to it, has some liabilities, and check with your broker before you do that. Notice that the next, the last part of that sentence says it is recommended that parties enter into an occupancy agreement or an agreement for retention of possession. So again, if that is possession is not to be given at closing, check with your broker. The three is going to be how you are representing the party that you are working with. If you're either an agent of the seller or a buyer, if you're a limited consensual dual agent, or if you're assisting one of the parties, either the purchaser or the seller as a transaction broker, check with your broker to find out how your company wants you to represent the buyer and the seller. Below that says receipt of the real estate brokerage service disclosure form is acknowledged. This is not part of the sales contract. However, the purchaser and sellers have to initial that they have been recatted per Alabama license law. This transaction is not to take place until the uh, buyer or the seller has been recatted by their licensee. So this just makes them acknowledge it. Four, these are some of the 
most contested parts of the sales contract. So I'll try and slow down for that. 4A, what that says is all the built-in systems in the house, heating, cooling, electrical, gas, plumbing, and septic are in, notice the word normal operating condition when title is passed or possession is given, whichever occurs first. The the seller guarantees that these systems be in normal operating condition. We're going to get down to 4D talking about the property inspection and we will, I'll bring up some points that come into uh, play when it comes to 4A. But remember, you're going to, prior to closing, you're going to do a walkthrough of the property and you're going to validate and verify that all the systems are still in normal operating condition. The seller has the obligation to leave the house, garage, yard, and outbuildings reasonably clean and free of debris. The sellers and the, buyer, uh, and the purchaser have to initial this. The next paragraph, B, talks about only pertains to homes built prior to or before 1978. There is a chance that lead base was used in the house. Lead base hazards, whether it be paint, whether it be some other uh, plumbing, et cetera, could have some lead in it. The purchaser has the right to do an inspection. It's done at their cost. And in my experience, I've only seen two of them that have come about. But it is a federal mandate. If the house prior to 1978, you must offer them the option of doing a lead-based paint inspection, checking for hazards. If they waive it, you put the date at the bold line and have them initial it. Check with your broker if you have any questions pertaining to this, especially if they want to uh, do a lead-based hazard inspection. Now, if the house is built after 1978, this paragraph is not applicable. 4C talks about what we used to call the termite letter. It's called a wood infestation report. Notice it says purchaser at his or her own expense, unless not allowed by VA guidelines. So in a normal arm length transaction, the buyer is going to be paying for the wood infestation report. The VA says that the seller has to provide a wood infestation report if somebody's getting a VA loan. Your lender will help you with that. Said report is to be presented to the closing attorney no less than seven working days prior to closing. So know that a wood infestation report is only good for 30 days. Also, the closing attorney must look at it at least one week prior to the closing. Okay, purchaser will have no obligation to make corrections. What that means is if there's active infestation or if there's damage that has uh, compromised the integrity of the home, the purchaser is not obligated to make those repairs. Corrections to be made by the seller unless mutually agreed upon by all parties. So remember the cost of the inspection is the purchaser. The repairs belong to the seller. Additional property inspections. This is one in the, in, in the contract, you'll check does or does not. If there is a does not required property inspection, check with your broker, find out if there's any additional documents that you need to get signed by the buyer saying you're assuming a lot of risk and liability by not having a property inspection done. So generally you're gonna have that checked and notice it says are required and inspection addendum is attached. So you, in, in conjunction with the sales contract, you are going to have a document called the inspection addendum to be filled out. There's a video that's already been done on that. Review that. If you have any questions, talk to your broker. It says the purchaser agrees to indemnify the seller and all real estate licensees for acts to himself, inspectors, and or representatives in exercise, exercising his right under this agreement. So what this does is lay down the foundation for the property inspection addendum or the inspection addendum. But this checks that the purchaser is going to do or is not going to do a home inspection. The E is a hold harmless. It just says neither the seller nor the licensee makes any representation or warranties regarding the condition of the property. So all that says is Alabama is a caveat emptor or a buyer beware state. It is incumbent up to the buyer to make sure all the information is correct and to their liking. This says that they didn't make any of those decisions 
um, from what the seller said or from what any real estate licensee said. This is our hold harmless, utilize it. Final inspection, you heard me talk about in 4A. Prior to closing, you're going to walk through the property and check all the systems to make sure that it is in normal operating condition. Financing. Basically, the FHA and VA, there are disclosures, additional documents that you'll need to submit with the um, uh, offer to purchase. There are required documents that need to go with them. So you'll find that in your MLS documents or in your dot loop. Conventional loan, this states that the house, they're going to do an appraisal. The appraisal is going to make sure that it has enough value to loan hundreds of thousands of dollars on the property. It may be worth more, but the value has to be a certain amount for the mortgage company to lend. That's how you will explain it to the buyer. If they're getting a conventional loan, you just tell them there's going to be an appraisal done to make sure that it has enough value to loan the money. Proration. This paragraph states that whatever the seller owes while they own the property, whether it be property taxes, HOA uh, fees, whatever it may be, while they live there, they're responsible for paying because at closing, it becomes a purchaser and they become responsible for it. So the attorney will explain if there's any credits or bills that have been paid prior to uh, the closing and then closing starts day one. It says that legal notice, seller acknowledged that under Alabama case law, simply entering into this purchase agreement to sell property destroys a joint tenancy with the right of survivorships and creates a tenancy in common. Honestly, this is something that you should refrain from. If they have any questions, tell them to refer to an attorney. But this one is a legal notice that we're required to disclose to the uh, purchaser. Risk of loss. This states that the seller has to keep property insurance on the home until the time of closing. Your purchaser will have to have insurance that takes place when they own the property. But the seller has contractually uh, agreed to keep insurance in place until the closing. If there is something that occurs and damages the house, they have the obligation to bring it up to the same standard or better when it, uh, as it went under contract. So this is a requirement. The seller cannot turn off the utilities and they cannot drop their insurance trying to save some money. They have to keep insurance in place until the closing of the property. It says here, also, if the purchaser elects to accept the property in its damaged condition, any insurance proceeds payable to the seller uh, would be payable to the buyer. This is if somebody's buying investment property, they're going to take the house down to the studs. Something happens, there's fire, there's a $40,000 insurance payment. The person that's buying this property as investment probably doesn't have a mortgage on it. It says, I'll take the money. And so the proceeds would go to him as opposed to having to bring it up to the same standards. Paragraph 10. This one says the systems, equipment, and appurtenances have the party that you're working with, the buyer or the seller, read over this closely. There are a lot of things in here that conveys with the property. Some of the things that don't, and it says in the last line, it's to be included on a personal property conveyance. Learn these things. You can't memorize them. There's so much and it's constantly changing, but const you need to be reviewing it. Make sure your buyers and sellers know what's staying. Notice like right in the uh, middle of it, it says window treatment, rod, and hardware. Some people think, oh, these blinds, I'm going to go ahead and take the blinds down. Well, this says the window treatments have to stay. So if something has to go, let's say it's a light fixture, let's say it's something else, it needs to be written in the additional provisions of the sales contract. It also says on paragraph 11 that if they have been notified that there's going to be additional assessments, public uh, improvements, road work or something, they have to make sure that the buyer knows about it and that um, they haven't already been taking place. Default. Now, this one's sort of misunderstood, but 
let's say one party decides to void the contract or try to void the contract. They can file a proceeding in a court of competent jurisdiction provided the proceedings are non-jury, and we're going to get down to what we call the arbitration clause. But let's say somebody breaches the contract. They want to sue. The only way that they can sue is, number one, there cannot be a jury involved, and number two, that the damages that have been uh, incurred does not exceed $3,000. So basically, you can look at it. It's three thousand and less. You go to small claims court. If it's not, you're bound by the arbitration clause that we're going to get ready and come up and start talking about. So that's how you explain that clause. Trust account. We have a lot of confusion and about earnest money. Earnest money is not required by law. However, I don't know of too many transactions that take place that nobody gives earnest money. So there's earnest money that's written that shows in good faith I am interested in purchasing this property. The licensee's company will put it in a trust account. If that does, if the uh, licensee's company does not hold earnest money, then a title company will put it in a uh, trust account. The only way that that can that money can be written out of that trust account is if the deal closes, everybody gets credit for it. If there is mutual agreement between the buyer and the seller stating if the transaction doesn't close and the buyer and seller say, hey, listen, we are, um, we've agreed, I'm going to give them back their earnest money, I'm going to get the earnest money, that's a mutual consent, mutual agreement, and that earnest money can be written out there. Or it's going to be the court order through either arbitration or interpleading into it. And that's how the earnest money, that's the third way it can be written out of the trust account. But the trust account, there's no other monies that go in there except earnest money. 14, alternative dispute resolution agreement by binding arbitration. This has a lot of words in it to say, if there is a conflict that arises both parties agree to go to binding arbitration as opposed to tying up the courts. So that's what's going to be. It explains everything in there. It's pretty cut and dry. But that says you can't. we're not going to get sued. Nobody's going to sue. Everything goes to binding arbitration. It has to be in the same county that the property's in. There's certain rules and, and laws pertaining to that. Again, last line all caps, except as specifically provided herein, this arbitration shall be in lieu of any civil litigation in any court and in lieu of any trial by jury. In other words, we're going to arbitration instead of going to trial by jury or anything in court. 15 is the terminology. Now, they, it, it's really important that you know what these days are. The term working days uh, is Monday through Friday, ending at 11.59. There are certain uh, holidays or the weekends, they do not count towards those working days. So if you have something that says 10 working days, you exclude the weekend. If there's a holiday in there, you exclude that and you just count the regular days. Electronic signatures. Basically, this says you can use dot loop, DocuSign, whatever your uh, form of document management is, you can send it via email. They can sign it, and it's been uh, it'll be considered a legal document. Entire agreement. What this states is doesn't matter what the listing agent or the selling agent do. It is an agreement between the buyer and the seller. Both parties, the buyer and the seller, have agreed 100% on every aspect of the everything that's written in here. That makes a contract. As the licensee, you write offers. When the buyer and the seller agree, then you have a contract. This says there has to be complete agreement before there's a contract. Always reduce it to written. Oral or verbal contracts are legal, but not admissible, and they're not enforceable. So what you do is reduce everything to writing. The last line says, the attorney can give information, the uh, closing disc, uh, documents to both agents. Additional provisions. If you have to write something in the additional provisions, something along the lines of property must appraise, 
washer and dryer to convey it no value, whatever it may be, that's where it's going to be written. Recommendation, don't write a lot. Talk to your broker about what you need to write and what you don't need to write. These are witnesses to the signatures of the purchaser. Now, you cannot sign it if you do not actually see them. So that witness is not as important if you watch them, as they say, an, a wet signature, sign it with a pen, then you can witness it or have somebody witness it. Outside of that, because it's an electronic signature, you don't need a witness on that. If it is your listing, the second box, please, please, please have your seller initial either accepts it, rejects it, or makes a counteroffer. Please do that. The binding date agreement. This says that the listing agent will sign it and date it as soon as all the signatures and everything has been ratified. So if someone submitted an offer on Monday, Tuesday there was a counteroffer, and then Wednesday they agree upon it, the binding date will be Wednesday, and that's where all the time frames start. Put the information in for the listing salesperson. You can get that information from the MLS. If you're writing the offer, you're the salesperson, put that information in. If there's any questions, please feel free to reach out to Valley MLS Support, this number, or you can email them at uh, uh, MLS Support at ValleyMLS.com. Good luck and thank you.